Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Hello. Let's kick off this next session. My name is Ella Whelan. I'm the co-convener of the Battle of Ideas Festival for this year. Uh, welcome to this session, Who Are the People? And I'm really excited about this in our keynote strand. Um, because I think we have all been guilty on all sides of politics of using the people to uh, benefit our arguments. I know that I do it, talk about the people in general. I can't count the amount of times I've heard politicians or commentators or someone in the media talking about the, the people and what it means to them. And it's not just in relation to Brexit, it's really in relation to all kind of policy and political areas in which we, whether it's to do with polls, whether it's to do with um, generalised about certain sections of society. We use this term, the people, in a kind of throwaway way, and this keynote is going to be about digging under that phrase, seeing what it actually means, and that's not kind of using you know, facts and polls to see what the actual classifications of society are. That's for a different time. What I want to talk about now is really what we mean politically, philosophically, what the history of the sense of the people is, and see if we can shed some light on this sort of... Uh, ambiguous term uh, and to do that I'm delighted that I have a fantastic panel with me today and I'm going to introduce them very briefly in the order that they're speaking and by the way you will um, have much longer bios for them they're very interesting people go and look at them up on the website and read up about them so first of all um, I have Sophia Gaston who is the director of the British Foreign Policy Group which focuses on Britain's international affairs but also pertinent to this session perhaps um, she conducts international projects on public opinion especially looking at populism um, and the media and democracy so welcome to be uh, next up, we have Akhil Ahmed, who is the Professor of Media at the University of Bolton, formerly the Head of Religion at the BBC and Channel 4, and uh, so I think something of a, um, an expert on the kind of public engagement with the media and the sense of you know, categorising people in that way, um, certainly he has something to say about that. Next up is uh, Lord Stuart Wood, who is a Labour member of the House of Lords, um, as well as teaching politics at Oxford for over 25 years. He now sits on the EU Select Committee, um, and he's primarily been Principal Advisor previously been principal advisor to Gordon Brown, helped run Ed Miliband's no, campaign in 2010 to become Labour leader, so I imagine uh, with general elections looming, he'll have some sense of the people and what that means in terms of um, political strategy, perhaps. And then last but not least, I have Mick Hume, um, who is a columnist for Spiked, where he formerly was the editor and the founder. His books include Trigger Warning, which is about the fear of offence and its impact on free speech. There is no such thing as a free press, which is a call to arms for a free press, and most most importantly for this session, right, revolting that. how the establishment are undermining democracy uh, and what they're afraid of, which I don't think needs much further explanation. So can you join me in welcoming our speakers? Just a quick bit of information on how this is going to run. You've had one session already, so you know. We're going to have introductory speeches from our speakers, and then I'm going to go straight out to the floor for questions and contributions. So please be ready to make your point. Without further ado, Sophia. Just thank you very much, out. and thank you for having me here. It's wonderful because to see so many people out and about on such a grim Saturday <laughs> afternoon, weather-wise, um, at least. So who are the people? Um, when I was reflecting on, on what I might talk about today, I think really what we're talking about here is the integration of populist discourse into our politics. So I should always, when we talk about populism, just set out a few definitional concepts um, what I mean in a very simple sense by populism is that it is a means of organizing our society and our political system into a number of distinct groups. So one group is the people, and the other group is the elite or the establishment. Uh, if you're talking about populism on the right, there is often a third group. Uh, this is often a sort of um, scapegoat group, a group that is seen to be interfering with the natural order of things. Um, we've seen many examples of immigrants, for example, being framed in this way. So one of the very dangerous aspects of populism is the way in which it injects a kind of purity into our political system. So the people are depicted as uh, innocent, morally pure, deserving. The uh, establishment, on the other hand, are framed as endemically corrupt and incapable of reform. 
And this really lends itself to a kind of escalation of discourse uh, into a very binary framework couched in terms of a sort of existential threat. So the establishment are branded as saboteurs, traitors, fat cats, obstructionists, enemies of the people. And the stakes are very high in this kind of landscape. I think populism is a politically useful framing and an increasingly electorally effective um, kind of framing as well, but it also takes liberal democracies into territories which are very difficult to draw back from. So it seizes on anemic levels of trust, which already existed, um, but it does make it then in turn very difficult to actually regain these. We often talk about populism as a kind of steam valve, and I certainly recognize that in this populist moment, there are a lot of things, uh, topics, issues, policies that had been sort of off the kind of over, outside of the Overton window of political um, debate and which are now in the arena of political consciousness, and there can be some value to that. But it does not in turn create a productive environment for these issues to actually be addressed. Populism inherently demands a more direct style of democracy. And there is a way of absorbing this in a constructive manner into a representative democracy. But when they come into contest with one another, as we have seen uh, so uh, distinctly captured in Britain since our 2016 referendum, it's very difficult to resolve this conflict. What you end up is a kind of cycle of disappointment. Citizens turning to their leaders for leadership and leaders turning to the citizens for leadership. So you end up with everybody chasing their tails. The other major issue uh, with populism, of course, is that you are dividing society into groups. It is predicated on division. And I think that in the long term, it is very difficult to govern with any kind of security or stability, and I would even add prosperity, uh, when you are embedding these kinds of divisions into our societies. And the reason that populism is so successful in taking root today um, in a number of advanced democracies is that it's coming at a time when burgeoning forms of conflict and competition were already coagulating within our society, with different groups starting to see other citizens as uh, competitors, uh, certainly in terms of access to scarce resources and so on. And I think the financial crisis actually played a very strong role in that, and we can come back to that later, I'm sure, in the discussion. But it also reflects the consequences of quite significant degrees of social change that have been taking place in our society. We have never been more diverse uh, and I don't just mean that in terms of sort of culturally or ethnically, um, in terms of demographics, but also in terms of socioeconomic divisions, the lived experiences between someone, for example, living in a large cosmopolitan urban metropolis and someone living in a small rural community, even within the same social grade. These conflicts and competitions also reflect uh, the legacy of many years of politicians themselves actually uh, actively pitting citizens against one another for electoral gain, um, whether in forms of class warfare from the left or discourses about the deserving or the undeserving poor. And I think populism is really an extreme extension of this process, and it does threaten to take us over a cliff that will be very difficult for us to come back from. So who are the people? Um, I really think that that should be all citizens in our society, including those who have the capacity to affect change. And citizenship confers both rights and responsibilities. And I think one of those responsibilities is also to see oneself as part of a shared community. Politicians need to take seriously the threat that populism populism poses to long-term health and sustainability of liberal democracies, and they really need to start thinking hard and fast about how we can foster a more substantive and enduring sense of common unity and purpose in societies that have been taught to pull apart. Thank you. Thank you, Smith.
Yeah, when I, when I was asked to be on this panel, I was wondering what I was going to be talking about because actually I thought, well, there's probably pe people better qualified. But when the questions come in, I'm sure there'll be specific questions about the media, but the th things I want to talk about are looking at demographic change. So when we talk about the people, who are the people? So I do a lot of work in the field of demographic change. And, and, and what does that mean? It means obviously how things are changing around us, the numbers of people, et cetera, and where they come from, what they do, who they are. And, and why it's relevant is because what we're seeing today is, I think, as a, if you look at the history of nationalism and all those kind of things that happened in the 19th and early and the 20th century, a lot of them were to do with not understanding the world that was changing around you. The whole notion of kings and, and empires was crumbling and people wanted freedom, etc. And you could look at whether, whether it was the Ottoman Empire or the British Empire, whatever empire, they were struggling to deal with people wanting something different than what the elites wanted. Now we're in a situation where we have, because of mass migration and all the things that are around us, that we're living in a situation where people don't understand what's happening around them. They may not like what's happening around them, and we're not having a, a proper conversation. Because we're having a conversation where people, with the conversation, if we look at the, the, the whole EU referendum, there were many people that com who believed that they, if, what they, if they voted in a certain way, that it would lead to some kind of a, a, a rolling back of of, of migration, a rolling back of immigration, and that that would be what they were really looking for. The fact of the matter is, if we look at what demographic projections tell us about Europe in particular, then the demographic projections tell us that in the next 30 years, there'll be something like 40% of Britain will be of a migrant background. Uh, and that's, that could be someone like me who was born here, or it could be somebody who comes you know, the day before. And if you look at other countries across Europe as well, it's 25%, it's 30%. So, we're not having a proper conversation because one, we're not having that conversation, and two, we're definite. We're talking from a point of view of what the situation is today and how people feel angry today. But actually, they're not thinking about what they need to think about in five, ten, fifteen, twenty years' time because the status quo isn't going to will not exist, and we'll have to think very differently. And examples of that are whether you agree or disagree, and this is just me stating it rather than agreeing with it, is. If you look at the things that have happened in schools in Birmingham, in certain areas of Birmingham, with regards to whether it be the, you know, the so-called Trojan horse thing, uh, uh, or the uh, issue with uh, trying to keep our L um, uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, lessons, etc., there were the people who lived in those geographical areas. That's what. They, in terms of the numbers of the vast majority of people who live there, that might be what they want. It may be, it's probably not what I want, I can tell you that now, but it's what they want. So when I was trying to do work around this bef what in my, before the BBC, I was trying to explain to people, it's not to say that we can fight what's going on or we can actually, um, uh, or we bring our own opinions into this. It's to say, how would we do the coverage for national news versus local news? Because what happens in that local area is a, a different audience to the national area. And that's the same for politicians, they have to start thinking along these lines because at the moment nobody is actually having this conversation. And the only people that seem to listen to me are businesses. You know, I gave a talk to the, and this is a real association, the European Association of Carlton Manufacturers. And um, uh, after, well, anyway, I <laughs> gave the talk and I thought this was a joke, but we, we, we looked at the map of Europe and, and I asked them, who do you think is the number one F minority group in that country to, in terms of numbers. And you know, we could, uh, we could do that pop quiz now if you really want to, we haven't got the time for it, but, but it tells you, it gives you a bit of a pattern. And that pattern is that certain groups, whether it be from the Middle East or Asia or Turkey in particular, there are significant numbers in Europe and there will be more of those numbers as, as time goes on. And so from the carton manufacturing point of view, it is to say, do you do what many politicians do and the media does, which is hide its head in the sand and not say, and say la, 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 and this will be somebody else's problem? Or do you think, how do we, what do we do about this? And I use the example of food, which was to say, if you think of a, a, a multicultural-ish type experiment that America is, that you have Chinese Americans, Italian Americans, you have all these people, and they're about as Italian, they're about as, Italian as, as I am. I've got a Vespa, I'm probably way more Italian than they are. Um, but the fact is, what do they all do? They all hang on to their food. 
And so the point I was making to these people is to say, look, if you if you look at the percentages of business that you that is going to be coming for people who may be of a, a Eastern, Middle Eastern origin, then where's that food going to come from? And where's that packaging going to come from? And, you know, the next day, one of the German guys said to me, we're having a meeting to talk about this when we get back because we're going to be looking at how can we invest in or take over or partner with a Turkish company because it's either that now or in 20 years' time they take over us because they'll have a bigger market share. So the fact of the matter is the conversations we're having, I think, aren't necessarily, th uh, necessarily forward-thinking. And... That's why when we talk about media literacy and cultural literacy and all those kind of things, they're really, really important because, as I said, conversation, not thinking forward and how those things are going to change, and we're not learning the lessons of what happened before. I wrote a paper on working class people not necessarily having an equal say in public service broadcasting about 13, 14 years ago. I remember some of my colleagues laughed at me and took the mickey out of me because it was only published in Sweden. The fact of the matter is, had they listened a little bit more then, then we may not have the silo kind of media that we're having now where people are talking to each other in their echo chambers and it's getting even worse. So that's what I'd like to leave this particular bit on is actually we need to understand what demographic change is gonna mean because it's gonna get worse, not better in terms of the disconnect. And secondly, we need to learn those lessons about what we got wrong in the past because we're only gonna repeat them again and next time it will be bigger. Thank you. Stuart. Okay, thanks. So, so from a, if, you, if you read political philosophy and the history of democracy, political philosophers always, always uh, ground authority in the people, but none of them ever discuss who the people are. If you talk to politicians, politicians talk about the people and they mean different things. Sometimes it's a fiction, sometimes it's a number, sometimes it's one person, sometimes it's the median voter, to use a political science term, sometimes it's everybody except the elite, and sometimes it's just the person who has the same values that you have. So I want to make five sort of sceptical points about how politicians and politics uses the term the people and end on a more positive note about how we should rethink of it. The first thing is there is no such thing as the will of the people. There is no such thing. The fundamental fact about people's views of the way, the way we live our lives and share our lives is that it's diverse. That's the hallmark, diversity and plurality. And the result of adding up votes or preferences about how we should make decisions is all dependent on the method you use. Uh, and therefore, we, we shouldn't have any kind of mystical property attached to the idea of the people. It is an ar the, the, a collective decision is a function of the rules we use to decide how we make collective choices. The people never speak as one. If they do, there's something seriously worrying going on. A vast array of people express different views, often highly constrained based on the choices people like me give them, for a vast array of reasons, forming different kinds of electoral alliances, uh, using rules of adding things up that vary across countries, within countries, across political systems. Once you look inside the sausage machine of how you add up votes and preferences to make a decision, you realise there is nothing magical about the idea of the people having a view. First point. Second point. Claiming that the will of the people is the same thing as democracy is, is not just dangerous, it's wrong. It's wrong because democracy is not the same as the will of the people. The will of the people, which I've just sort of, you know... De decomposed, even if you believe in a strong version of that. Democracy is lots and lots of things together. It's the idea of limited government, the idea of indirect representation, the idea that people have the right, the fundamental ability to remove people who govern them through elections. It's living according to a constitution that has a higher status than simple law. It's a system that is grounded on the rule of law. And yes, it's the idea of the majority winning in some way, depending on the rules you choose. There are tensions between these things, and the, the Brexit referendum and the consequences of that, for me, are a classic example of tensions between the ingredients we want in our democracy. The great democratic theorists like Madison, who wrote the US Constitution, and Tocqueville, who inspired it, um, they, are, they were very, very worried about the idea that the majority principle dominates every other feature of what we want in a representative democratic government. And they were right to worry about that, not because they're elitist, but because majorities are inconsistent with themselves. They, t they sometimes care less about law and constitutionality than we all have a right to expect. They're prone to misinformation, and they often trample on rights. They don't always, but they can do, and that's why other aspects of a democracy are important part of what a democracy is. The third point is, 
the relationship between the principle, the, the, the principle of, uh, uh, of the people and the principle of majority rule is a very complicated one. The reason we have a majority as a rule for deciding how we do things is because people don't agree. But you get to a majority view in so many different ways. You can have a first-past-the-post system. You can have a straight choice between two candidates or two views. You can have a preferential voting system. People vote tactically. There's all sorts of complexities in the way that we get to decisions. What's the point about this? The point is that when we have faith, when we, when we decide that we have to stick to the result of a referendum or an election, even when they don't clash, what we're doing is maintaining faith in the rules that we have collectively chosen to generate collective decision. So ultimately, having faith in the people is really about having faith in constitutions or rules about how we make decisions. And we may have a different set of rules to Sweden or France or any other country in the world, but it's the faith in those rules that actually is the proxy for sticking by the people. Fourth point, the great tension in my view of our time is actually a struggle for two different views of the people. You might call it a liberal view and a populist view. The liberal view is that democracy is about including the voices of all people. And the problem with that, they, they think, is that unjust social structures, histories of oppression, prejudice, inequality, mean that the voices of some of those people cannot be heard. So putting the people first in the liberal view is about a project of inclusion, breaking down the barriers, economic, social, identity, other barriers, that stop some people who are excluded from taking part. The populist idea of the people is almost the reverse. Here, democracy, in the populist view, is about making sure ordinary people have their voices heard. And the populist view is that the liberal project of smashing social structures is actually a kind of elite guardian project. The populist would rather see people on the margins assimilate that, than see them get special treatment. And in fact, the ire, the, the ire of populists is exercised not against social structures that are unjust, but against politics and politicians. And it wants to put people in place in power who overhaul politics itself. And that's the great struggle, in my view, a liberal vision of the people that's radical about social change, and a populist vision of the people that's radical about political change. You need both. We absolutely need both. In the last three years, these two have become in serious tension. But the idea that you don't need both is wrong. In my view, the, the complacency about political par of political parties, including my own, I work for Gordon Brown, including us, about globalization and its effects, needed a populist challenge, and thank goodness we got it. Last point, and I'll stop. How do we respond to this te tension? By re-empowering the public sphere. We have parts of our public sphere that at the moment are not places of genuine debate between alternatives about how we run our society. And I include universities in this. It's very difficult if you're a Brexiteer to have an open voice in our universities at the moment, students or academics. That is a problem for a, a, a bastion of a place where there should be play, uh, a debate about the future of our, of our country. And I think politics has this as well, some characteristics of this as well. I don't have uh, transformational faith in citizens' assemblies, but I think introducing them as a regular part of how we get together across divides, old, young, Brexit, anti-Brexit, north-south, rural, urban, is a really important way to re-stimulate the idea of talking across divides. And that, for me, is a much more tractable and, and feasible way of thinking about how to resurrect the idea of the people. Thank you, sir. And now next. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, whenever we have a political crisis, one thing you, uh, one sure symptom of it is that words and language and interpretations become a battleground. And everybody starts claiming um, the kind of linguistic high ground for themselves. So in the Brexit uh, debate, everybody wants to be on the side of democracy. Um, those of us who support Brexit claim we're on the side of democracy because 17.4 million people voted for it. Those who have spent three and a half years blocking democracy in Parliament claim that they are defending parliamentary democracy. No one is allowed to be anti-democracy. And the same thing is really true uh, of the people. Um, the Daily Mail can attack uh, judges for uh, uh, interfering in Brexit by calling them the people, the enemies of the people, uh, a very low, historically loaded uh, kind of language, but nevertheless some might think it legitimate for three judges to think that they know better than 17.4 million people uh, voting in the ballot box. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a campaign uh, like the People's Vote, a campaign for the second referendum which claims the moral high ground by calling itself the People's Vote, uh, as if the original vote in 2016, there were some other species that were voting uh, <laughs> uh, other, than, other than people. Um, this is not just about language and words, it's about power. 
It's about who controls uh, 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 the debate and, and which side is winning. Um, one of my favourite philosophers, uh, whenever we discuss an issue like what, does a, what do words mean in politics, uh, is um, Humpty Dumpty, uh, as described by Lewis Carroll in his, his discussion with Alice through the looking glass. When Humpty Dumpty says, uh, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master? That's all. In other words, who rules writes the rules. So that's when we're talking about a discussion about language and the meaning attached to people or democracy. We're really talking about power and who has the upper hand uh, in, a, in, a, in a political battle, and never more so, I think, uh, than in the arguments about uh, uh, Brexit and democracy. So I want to go back to basics, uh, two and a half thousand years back to um, ancient Athens, where it was established that the meaning of the people is the demos. The demos, the foundation stone of, of democracy as it was uh, uh, um, created in a, in, a, in a very different way uh, in that society, the basis uh, of democracy. As um, Peter Cartledge says in his History of Democracy, which I recommend to everybody, um, the demos could mean, in, in ancient Athens, could mean either all of the people or it could mean the very lower strata of the people. But in either case, it was always the people against the oligarchy, the small uh, elite uh, of the establishment, the powerful elite at the top of Athenian society. Um, that was not a division invented by uh, uh, demagogues. Um, it was a real division in society, the demos uh, against the oligarchy. Inter incidentally, talking about language and the way it get, they gets reinvented, uh, demagogue, which is now um, definitely a boo word uh, in politics, uh, actually only originally meant um, leaders of the people, which is now a kind of terrible thing to be, uh, 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 apparently, in our, in our modern political uh, discourse. So that's a real division in those societies. Obviously, when we talk about the demos and the people in ancient Athens, you recognize that the only people they were interested in were white male citizens. Uh, no women and no slaves were ever counted as being part of the demos or the people and didn't, and didn't have any voting rights. Uh, so uh, uh, things have moved on considerably. But nevertheless, there's something in the, the essence of the, the people being the demos, I think, for us. Um, two, so two things I'd like to uh, reflect on in relation to that. One is that the demos, as the basis of democracy, is a collective. And a majority of that collective rules. That's what democracy is about. However much you might want to play around with clever words and philosophies around democracy, that's basically what it's about. And when 17.4 million people vote for something, the largest vote for anything ever in British political history, that, if you want to describe something as the will of the people, that's about as close to it as you can get. 17.4 million people, the largest vote in British democratic uh, history. And those people are the demos who vote for that or vote for the other side are certainly not, to reflect on some of the other points made, um, we shouldn't imagine that they are morally pure uh, uh, or, or, um, or anything like that. Um, that's just tough. Um, we, have, we put up with the majority decision because of what we believe in democracy. And we, neither should we worry about the fact that there are divisions uh, in the demos. A division is the basis of democracy. I don't understand why division has become this terrible thing everyone's worried about. That's the basis of democracy. You have a, you have a division. Otherwise, you have an imposed consensus from the top down. That's nothing democratic about that. A democracy is founded on a division, an argument, and then you come to a resolution, and one side wins, and one side loses the argument. Um, so I don't think we should be so scared of the idea of division as being somehow antithetical to democracy. So a democracy is a collective, majority rules. But it's also a collection of individual citizens, uh, each of which must enjoy the same freedoms, including the free freedom to speak out against the majority view, and each of whom has to have equal rights. And with the general election around the corner, it's a very appetite, uh, appetite moment to remember that that means fundamentally in our democracy, the right to vote. And everybody has the right to vote, and everybody's vote counts the same. That's what we mean when we talk about the people, the demos as a, as a collective of individuals. You don't have to qualify for that on the basis of your ethnicity or your age or your, uh, apart from being over 18, which I th think is an, is an entirely healthy one, um, or your income or your education. Everybody, every adult in society uh, has the same uh, right to vote. When Gina Miller goes to the High Court to try and disrupt Brexit, um, the people who uh, are clerks and cleaners in the High Court uh, have the same right to vote as she does uh, on the important day of general election in six weeks' time. So the election, I think, is an important moment to remember uh, 
what demos and democracy mean. And the foundation of democracy, as I always have to end by saying, is not only the demos, the people. The other half of that word invented in ancient Athens is kratos, or kratos, power, control. It is the people exercising power uh, that is democracy, and that's something that we look forward to seeing uh, in, the, in the next six weeks, that the people must, in the end, be sovereign. And trust, a word which gets banned about a lot these days, has to work both ways. We need leaders we can trust. We also need leaders who can trust people to make their own democratic decisions. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, some really interesting points raised there. Let's get stuck into the discussion. I've got microphones, volunteers with microphones on the left and the right. So let's see some hands. Um, please stand up when the microphone comes to you because this is being filmed and make yourself known. So if we pass one to the middle here, if you, this, this microphone on the left comes down there. And show me your hands and we'll get the microphone moved to you. So in the front down here, the second microphone comes all the way down to the front. I'm going to take four, three, four, five, and we'll come back to the panel. Thanks. Um, it's kind of a question to the whole panel, but it kind of touches on something that uh, Sophia kind of raised in her discussion. And it's about the integration of the notion of the people into a kind of populist discourse. But I just wonder whether the kind of actual integration is a, a kind of anti-populist discourse, because uh, I'm reminded of the kind of SNP, Scottish Nationalist Party's reaction to losing the 2014 independence referendum. Massive turnout, 86% turnout in Scotland. However, losing that referendum by quite a sizable margin, 10%, they launched uh, a campaign to go on a people's conversation to find out what the people actually think and want. Well, the people told them what they wanted. They didn't want independence. So is it not the case that actually the incorporation of the people, the demotic, is actually a product of a kind of anti-populist discourse? It's, it's deployed when the people actually speak. Thank you. In the front here, let's stand up. Um, I want to just step back uh, a little and take up some of the themes from the first discussion, which people might have been um, in, uh, about uh, community and um, belonging, because um, I think it was Sophia at the beginning you said uh, about citizens, and I think that um, in some ways begs a question of who belongs and how people come to be able to belong in society. And um, I'm not in a kind of, um, uh, I don't know, tugging heartstrings way, referring to the Windrush people. Uh, I'm referring to them, but also many, many um, migrants living in the UK who've lived in the UK for a very long time find themselves not only not being invited to belong in a formal sense, in other words, become citizens, even though they may feel that they belong. Um, but over the last few years, laws have made them even more insecure. So you have long routes to settlement, high fees, um, and uh, a definition of precariousness, as well as the hostile environment. So you have people here whose children are born here, lived here for 15, 20 years, and who are belonging less and less, even though in their communities they are regarded as belonging. Thank you. Here in the front. Um, this, is, um, this is picking up on the first comment, but uh, relating it to Brexit. Um, the Stuart said, division is the basis of democracy, um, and, uh, and the winner wins. And I wonder if what has changed um, is that the loser no longer accepts defeat. <laughs> okay, thanks. Any more hands and we'll come back to the panel? At this moment, can we bring down in the front here? Thanks. Uh, signal to me while other people are speaking so I can get the microphone to you. Thanks, sir. Um, there's mention of populace. Every single person that refers to populace has a different meaning. Um, surely surely popu um, a populist uh, thinking should mean that the majority of people, because it's a popular version, but populist today seems to refer to strictly right-wing um, negative thinking. Shouldn't, I, I just can't get my head around that. And as I say, every single person has a different view on it, and it gets more confusing uh, and less illustrative of what it actually means. Okay. 
Thank you. Right, one more and then we'll come back to the panel. Um, the governance of society is a decision-making process. Um, so surely um, if morality is, is objective, then decisions um, can be said to be objectively um, the best course of action. Um, so is democracy not just an argument for majority fallacy, saying um, the majority of people think this is true, this is the best course of action, therefore we should take this course of action? It, it's a logical fallacy. There's no reason why uh, the opinion of the people should have any sway on what's objectively good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Right, we'll come back to the panel. Sophia, do you want to pick up on anything there? Don't feel the need to answer everything, just mm -hmm. some comments. Um, so, yeah, on the, first, on the first question about the people, I... I disagree that the, the people is being deployed in an anti-populist way. What's actually happened is that we've imposed a populist framework on our political systems, and now all sides are invoking populist rhetoric. And that is because as soon as you start to do that, it becomes very difficult to get off the ride. If one side is being depicted within a populist framework, it's very difficult for them to operate outside of that without playing into their opposition's hand. So I absolutely take your point about, you know, and we've discussed on this panel some of the diverse applications of the people on various sides, including by some who would see themselves as outside of the populist framework. None of them should kid themselves that they are outside of it. It's, it's, it's more about the fact that there is an entire system um, of, of framework impo imposed on our system. Um, on the second point, I think so, uh, this point around uh, social integration is really critical. Um, fostering a stronger sense of community, inclusive citizenship, I mean, these are critical underpinnings yeah. to the model of deliberative democracy in which we've sort of based our conceptions of our representative democracy. Um, and I think, you know, we have talked a little bit about division and diversity and whether or not they're a good or a bad thing. I, I, I agree that we can depict them in both um, favorable and pejorative senses. I mean, for example, I think conflict, you know, some of the greatest social advances of hum humanity have come through uh, quite significant social conflicts playing out, um, sometimes even in violent ways. So I think it, it's quite a critical uh, underpinning of our democracy that we do have diversity of views and opinions and conflicts are allowed to coalesce within that. Um, that said, you have to accept that you are part of a community. And that also leads on to this point that was made about essentially loses consent. Um, the reason I think why loses consent has become so difficult to foster is because, as I referred to earlier, there is, the stakes have been elevated now to a point where the threats feel existential. If you look at uh, really extensive polling has been done on this by Pew Research in, in the US, if you look at the ways in which Republican and Democratic voters regard one another and how that's shifted uh, since the 1970s, they actually are now fearful of the other side taking power in a, really, in a really critical way that makes them feel that every one of those votes um, is, is sort of a life or death um, decision. So um, I think that's played into that enormously. Um, and just finally on, on populism, the, the framework that I set out for populism that is an academic framework. There is a, an academic consensus position around that. But I absolutely take your point that the word populist has been deployed in all sorts of very um, spurious ways, and certainly outside of what academia would agree um, is, is purposeful and meaningful. I do think it is important not to just say that there is no value at all to looking at populism. Um, we just need to be careful where we deploy it. And also, populism is just as much um, a phenomenon on the left as of on the right, and this election campaign will certainly embody many aspects of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that's Bernie Sanders and you know, and, um, and Jeremy Corbyn, etc. I think they show that populism is definitely not just a right-wing thing, but actually populism is a... Um, it's interesting how people always refer to it as a negative, and it doesn't necessarily need to be. Uh, and, and often populism is, is, is something which uh, people own, uh, and the people who, the elites or, who, the, or, the, sta or, the, or the, the, the status quo, the, the, the governing groups, for them, populism is always a problem because obviously it's, it, 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 it inevitably means that they're not part of the, 
they're not going to be coming to the party and they're not going to be leading the party in the future. And I think of, you know, uh, many people from, in terms of popularism, the popularism of, say, Ab an Abdul Nasser type character in the, in the 50s and 60s revolutionized the, the Middle East and then was destroyed. And you could go every single populist regime from that particular period was anti-imperial. Then we now we have populism. Everybody's a populist. It? it seems like you know, you know, it, uh, as is as is Trump. We could go on. So the, all, this 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 thing about you know who owns and who defines what populism is is I think the bigger issue. The bigger issue is people don't want people to actually have to to have pop, to, to have populism as something because actually it may deliver something that they can't control. And I think and that that's the key to understanding all of this. Actually, is it goes back to that point that was made about community and who gets to be in the community and who doesn't and all the kind of things that and people who decide is because people decide who they want. That there are still groups within society who will decide who is the right person, whether it be the right person to run the country or the right person to vote or the right person to do a particular kind of job, and and that's the kind that at the core that's the core of what is a problem with this with 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 issues around. Uh, the community and with issues around who becomes a member of, of that community and why you have things like Windrush and all those things because it goes back to that point of people who wanted to control things. They want to still control things and that's where it comes in. So when I think about the, the, the kind of the big, the things that were made, the, the point that this, this chap here made about um, whether or not just because something is popular doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing or it's because people vote for it. But that, that's... That's, a, that's, a, that's the key to all of this. There are things that I particularly like that people don't like. And it keeps going back to this, this thing I wanted to make, so I'll wrap up now, but it just goes back to that point, which is we're just not having the right, com we're just not having the conversation because the conversations are all completely wrong. We're, we're talking about these people, we voted, so therefore implement what we say. Well, let's have a conversation about who voted and what they voted for, and then we can implement it. And that's not me saying that I'm a, I'm a Remainer or anything like that. I'm just simply saying it applies to absolutely absolutely everything. Let's have more conversations, but conversations though, which are based on populism, but also based on a bit of information with regards to what that populism may result in. Okay, thank you. Stuart, anything you want to pick up just, on? Just, maybe just one thing, which is um, uh, this point about uh, losers not accepting defeat. I mean, I do think that is, I think the reasons Brexit hasn't happened are actually very complicated. I don't think they're very straightforward at all. I think Mick and I probably would disagree about that. But I do think that one of the problems is that if you study... This is a bad analogy in a way. But um, if you study civil wars, one of the problems of civil wars is civil wars don't end until both sides think that they're not going to get their desired way and that a compromise is better than losing completely. Right? The problem with Brexit at the moment, in my view, is no one's given up. Right? Whatever your view, ranging from the hardest Brexit imaginable tomorrow to second referendum or revoke Article 50 or, and everything in between, nothing has yet been ruled out. And the reason nothing's yet been ruled out is because we have this complex world in which you have a hung parliament, we've had it for a long time, we've got another election coming up, governments can't get their way, fixed term parliaments act means that governments are paralysed, uh, the election delivered a parliament that didn't match the, the, the expressed uh, majority of the referendum before. So you've got this conflict between different features of our constitution and that's given a, a cover for a lot of people to not give up on basically reinventing the whole thing and starting again. And I think that is, that is something which actually needs a fundamental revisiting, to go back to my remarks earlier, about a collective... We have to have a collective authorship about the rules we use to decide things, which revisits in the light of the last three years, because it's been a disaster. Okay, thanks, Mick. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, yes, some very good points about um, populism made. I think it's fascinating, actually. It comes back to the beginning, what I was talking about, about the different interpretations of a word in different political crises. When populism first uh, emerged in politics in the 19th century, it's actually seen as a po positive thing. Mm -hmm. it was actually populist part we are the populist party uh, in America. Um, whereas in today's political discourse, it's almost entirely a boo word. It's something you use to try and uh, say that this is beyond the pale, this is something we can't have. Um, if you look up the dictionary definition of uh, uh, populism, I think it's something like uh, politics based on giving people what they want. Well, we can't have that. Uh, so um, uh, populism has become, in my opinion, and it, it is a bit of a generalisation, but in most times that populism is used, a boo word in this way, I, when I hear the word populism, I interpret it as meaning democracy. What they're really saying is, when they attack populism, we don't like democracy when it delivers 
They're just the wrong decisions. That's what populism is. It's a democratic movement, it's a mass movement, it's a vote that we don't like. Uh, and that's why it's, uh, and, then, and then it becomes uh, uh, described as populism. And I think this ties in very much to this problem of loser's consent we were talking about, because there is something new happening in that respect. Um, I mean, it's never been the case and shouldn't be the case that just because you lose an election, you give up politics. Mm. Um, you know, you're entirely entitled to campaign uh, for your cause, even if you're a minority of one. I know that. I've been in very small minorities and many issues over the years. Um, that's not, that, 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 we're not talking about that, kind of doffing your cap and going home. But when you have an active attempt to block a democratic decision and, and a refusal to accept it and, to un and, and seeking to undermine it using whatever legal or other uh, uh, device uh, comes to hand, that's going to something different. I think what that is about to me is something that's quite specific to the times we live in, that recent political decisions, and I particularly think of um, Brexit, the Brexit vote in, in Britain and the election of Donald Trump uh, in America, go break outside of the normal kind of... Uh, to's and fro's of left-right politics over the previous uh, 50 years. They are considered by a strong element of the establishment on both sides of the Atlantic, and they're very different kind of processes, but we, I'm just generalising, to take them together for the second. They're considered to be uh, beyond the pale. When uh, Ariana Huffington was asked to her reaction to the election of John, Donald Trump, she said it was uh, incomprehensible. Not just, she didn't just disagree with it, I think it was a bad idea, it was incomprehensible, it was beyond her comprehension, beyond her belief that people could possibly have voted uh, for Donald Trump. And I think the reaction of the British uh, establishment, the Liberal establishment in particular, to uh, Brexit is in many ways comparable, all kinds of uh, polls that showed that large numbers of them thought that people were too thick and shouldn't have the vote uh, who, who, who voted Leave. So you've got something which, is, which are seen as genuine popular revolts against an establishment, and that's why you had the withdrawal of losers' consent, and that is a very uh, uh, difficult and uh, a new situation we find ourselves in with democracy today. Okay, thanks. Let's go back out. So sh show me hands, and I'm going to come to you. I also just want to raise one point, which is that we've had a lot of discussion about populism. I also want to bring the mic up there to that person. I also want to talk about, I mean, who are the people? Do the people have a sense of themselves as the people? I mean, we have discussions about the danger of people gathering in relation to political conventions, but do, you know, do people's sections in society have a sense of themselves as the people, or has that been damaged in this process? So if one mic um, coming there, and then the second mic down to this person waving. Go ahead. I think uh, the question is not whether the majority is right. Uh, I think no one ever claimed that the majority is always right. The question is, in a political community, who has the right to decide the course of the nation? And that is the fundamental question. Not who is right, but who has the right to decide. And the thing is, in a democracy, it is premised on the idea that all citizens are equal, and I think we all agree with this. So who is to decide? One man, in a, like a king? Well, then his voice counts for more than all the others. All are equal, but some are more equal than others. Namely, this monarch is more equal than everyone else. An oligarch is the same. But uh, if you have a democracy and you say all people are truly equal, the only just way to decide what the nation should do is to let the greater number of equal voices trump the lesser number of equal voices. And that is a fundamental point. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it is wrong to say that the majority rules in a democracy. Because democracy does not mean the rule of the majority. It means the rule of the people. And the majority is only part of the people. The other part is the minority. So I think the rule of the people is the, uh, it, the will of the people is not simply the will of the majority, but the will of the minority and majority to go along with the will of the majority. OK, thank you. Pass the microphone to the guy just behind you there. Stand up, please. Thank you. Thank you. I've got two separate points. Um, so I'm um, reminded of um, before the American election, I remember reading something which basically said that 95% of Americans had not read an article that would have taken them more than about five minutes to actually read before the election. So this is about misinformation, really, is my question. So I think it's very easy to sort of um, disparage the fact there's misinformation and how that may have influenced people's decision making, because it's all, it's all equal. I, everybody can misinform. But if you remember the Olympics about 15 years ago, when nine of the 100 meter um, finalists who were on that start line were um, disqualified subsequently because of um, drugs testing that um, later revealed that they were all cheats. So who wants to watch that kind of a game when everybody's cheating? Sorry, and my second quick point is about um, having the conversation, which I'll pick up on the, the point that you were particularly raising. So remember before Brexit occurred on question time, there's a very valid question for the audience about um, different kinds of, uh, dif dif different kinds of, different kinds 
of immigration. And the Labour and Tory politicians were unable to answer the question. They just said, oh, I, I know a West Indian family I've known for 30 years. I've known an Indian chap who runs the, the local corner shop. So unable to answer the question. And the Brexit Party representative, or the, the other one, uh, said that, well, there's different stratas of immigrants, depending on when they arrive in the country, their, their grandparents, their, kid, their children. Now, it didn't um, persuade me, but I thought at least he was presenting a sort of cogent argument. We need to look at and answer what is a difficult question in a more intelligent way. So I think there is a, a kind of void of having an, in, an intelligent debate about um, um, tricky questions. Okay, thank you. Over here with the microphone. And then if you can... Couple of, couple, Go ahead. couple of quick things. Um, one is, <clears throat> are, there le are there levels of democraticness? If you, there's been a kind of, some kind of an attempt to somehow delegitimize the, the Brexit vote, um, which had huge numbers, and at the same time say that the, ME, the, the, the European Parliament is very democratic and it barely ever gets to 50% vote. So is, there, is it more legitimate when the turnout is bigger? And is it less the other one? The other one is the idea of um, losers and winners. When you have a bifurcation like 52-48, isn't it legitimate to think of it as a reason to try and find common ground and compromise rather than to say, we'll go with what this set wants and completely ignore what the other one wants? Okay, thank you. At the back. Thanks. Uh, I'm not sure I know what the uh, exact definition of the people is, but I think I'd recognise it if I saw it. On the other hand, uh, with regards to populism, I'm not sure that any... I mean, I, I take Mick's point about the there was a populist party or there may have been a party which called itself populist in the past, but I don't know anyone who would call themselves a party. And they might call themselves a Democrat, a Conservative, a uh, Labour Party supporter, a, a Britain, uh, 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 an Irish person or whatever. But populism or populist is a term which has been invented by uh, some of the people on the panel clearly uh, and it uh, is associated words with words like extreme threat and dangerous so I think it's a categorization uh, of the people for uh, purposes which are to do with ideas that you don't like ie uh, uh, brexit or um, you know bringing back hanging for example uh, as a you know something that we might end up with if, uh, if we gave the people the uh, the right to choose and I just want to ask a question uh, to the person who's uh, on the panel who hasn't been elected into a position of power uh, whether he uh, if there was a, a referendum on whether we should abo uh, abolish the House of Lords or not, and we all voted to do it, whether he'd find that a complex question. <laughs> okay, thank you. There's someone with a microphone here. Next to you. Hi. Um, yes, Sophia, you said um, in terms of populism, the people opposed as pure and the establishment are the evil. On the latter, I'd absolutely agree with you. I don't know how you can get more evil an extreme to spend the last three and a half years denying democracy. On the former, I don't know what planet you're living on. 17.4 million people, the majority of the citizens of this country, voted to leave the EU. They have been disparaged in the most despicable way by the entire elite and their lackeys for all that time. So where you get the idea that the people are regarded as pure, I have absolutely no idea. You did say one sentence, though, you said that populism demands direct democracy, which is difficult to absorb into representative democracy. And that's exactly what's been happening for three and a half years. The elite will not accept the will of the majority, and they're finding it extremely difficult to get out of the, out of the hole that they've dug themselves into. And I have to say, I'll be very quickly, I agree with this chap. For you to sit there, Stuart, as an unelected member, to disparage our will the will of the people with your mental gymnastics, when really all you're doing, and you've said it twice, I'll finish now. You said there Quick. is no such thing as the will of the people. Democracy is not just about the will of the people, but I'm sorry, that is what it is about entirely. Because if it's not, who is it about? Not people like you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. That microphone, <laughs> that microphone comes down to the lady in the, in the green card can hear. At the back. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's striking that the, the discussion today and more broadly outside this room uh, about the people, about democracy, about populism is entirely negative. It's all about restraint. It's all about holding people back. It's about this notion that the people is dangerous. And I kind of find that uh, problematic, partly because I like the idea of the people being um, outgrowing the current institutions um, and actually um, becoming a, a threat to the status quo. That's a good thing. And 
if you compare that with only a few years ago when we were talking about the big society and active citizenship, there was a much more positive notion of involving people in politics and in institutions. So what's happened? You know, why have we become more negative? Is it because the people uh, are only likable uh, in theory rather than when they actually do exert themselves? OK, thanks. Can you pass that microphone to the lady next to you there? And here we go. Yeah. Um, yes, um, the question was, um, who, who are the people? Um, it, to me, it's everybody who lives here. It is tied up with the notion of a nation, but it's everyone who lives here and is committed to living here wherever they were born. Um, if we then start talking about um, what is the will of the people, OK, I agree that we're not all going to ever 100% agree on one thing. But therefore, as it has been said, democracy is about making decisions, and that has to be based on the majority decision. We will have discussion and we will have debate, and that is exactly what we had during the referendum. We had an awful lot of discussion and an awful lot of debate, and people thought. And as uh, Mick Hume said, Gina Miller's vote was just as valuable as her cleaner's vote. It was just as valuable as your vote and just as valuable as mine. Neither she nor our supreme judge has the right to overturn the decision of 17.4 million people. OK, thank you. And at the back, final point. Final point for this round. I'm coming back out. Hi. Um, my comment is about uh, what was spoken with regards to collective decision making. Um, I'm wondering how that is a sensible course of action when, because of the way the, demo the processes that we claim are democratic function, uh, the entire concept of this collective decision making works on incomplete information, blatant misinformation sometimes, misrepresentation of facts. And um, because the structure mostly demands that politicians usually don't care about a lot more than winning the next term. And I suppose my main point is that it is in the best interest often of the powers that be that the people remain impressionable and in the dark. And our education systems reflect that, mostly in developing countries, by encouraging obedience rather than critical thinking. And it really angers me that we're saying, we're claiming that it is the choice of the people when we're not equipping them with the tools that it takes to truly make informed choices. Thank you very much. OK. Coming back to the panel now for really brief, I mean, like one minute points, just make one point each. Me. Uh, OK, well, two very quick points. One, um, I agree entirely with the idea about it's about time we had some intelligent debate about difficult subjects and stopped avoiding them because they're too dangerous. If you let people start talking about immigration, we're going to have a race riot the whole, because the, the whole of our population is really just one big uh, pogrom waiting to happen, uh, which is the kind of prejudice that suppresses discussion on difficult subjects. I mean, definitely, democracy needs that. Uh, and we need to trust people uh, to take intelligent decisions on them. Secondly, there's a question of turnout. Um, it can, it can be a mark of legitimacy or, or, or illegitimacy. Um, I think if there's a referendum uh, coming up, if the Labour Party were to get its second referendum, for example, and offer us a choice between remain or remain, uh, then I would hope the turnout would be about 25%, and that would be, that would be a very important thing to be uh, uh, campaigning for. Um, I have a lot to say about the House of Lords and its democratic uh, qualities, but I'll leave that to our after Stuart to uh, mm -hmm. uh, Well, far away, Stuart. <laughs> not on, uh, not on, just, just two on points. Um, uh, I, I very much agree with the gentleman who spoke first, by the way, about the combination of majority and minority acceptance. I think that's absolutely, absolutely central. My, my point to the two people who had a, had a little pop at me, I understand why. Um, uh, I am, um, by the way, I'm not, I'm not in favour of ripping up the referendum result. I don't know where some people got that idea from, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, and the House of Lords, yeah, I've, I voted for getting rid of the House of Lords. I think the House of Lords should, I don't, I don't think there's a place for an unelected second chamber in a modern democracy. I, I agree with that. But, but, the, 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 if you look at history, the, the reason that the House of Lords has not been scrapped, both in the, sorry, what are you doing, sir? You, you did this, what's that mean? What is, are you saying what I'm saying is because of money, or...? OK, because, all because, these questions will come at you. I'll, I'll, come at, I'll come back to that in a sec. But the, the, the reason the House of Lords, in, in the early part of the 20th century, in the late 60s, didn't get, didn't get scrapped, it's not because there's a majority to get rid of it. There is. It's because no one can agree on what to replace it with. And that is the essential thing if it ever came to a referendum. There has to be an accompanying thing about what replaces it, rather than just a declaration of hatred for people like me. I understand that, OK? That's the first thing. The second thing is on... Uh, now, now. 
<laughs> the, second, the second thing is on um, the will of the people. My point about the will of the people not existing was not saying that democracy shouldn't be based on popular consent. Of course it should. Of course it should. I'm not saying that people like me, instead of democracies and elections, should make decisions. That wasn't what I was saying. I was saying it's dangerous to think that there is a single view that is expressed in the complex process of, de de of generating a majority to make a decision. Mick is right. We make decisions. We, d we, have, div we have, of course, complex different reasons for supporting something. But we end up making a decision and we stick by it. That is a very different thing from calling that thing the will of the people. That was the, end of, that was the point I was making. Brilliant. Um, I think the, the two things that link together in the different kind of immigration, the conversation, there's been no real proper conversation about immigration and, um, and the whole thing about, where, you know, in terms of collective decision making, we have not equipped with the tools. I think there's... There's a, there's a big point here, which is we have such ridiculously poor cultural and religious literacy and all of those kind of things that we in this country that actually we don't understand each other. And the fact of the matter is, I, I, that's the reason why I talked about the, how demographic change is, com, is, is coming. It's like it's, it's going to hit us so much more. Is the fact of the matter is just using one thing, religion. You know, we we are supposed to have lived in a post-Christian Europe for the last 100, 150 years. The rest of the world is religious. The rest of the world now, whether it be through digital technology or migration, is living here, so therefore we have to understand that religion is now possibly back in the public space and mm. is going to become more and more relevant. So if we don't have that literacy, then how can we make uh, informed decisions about people? So when we talk about the lack of conversation around immigration, it's not because there's going to be race riots. That's not, that's not the case. It's because we can't have conversations because most people haven't got a clue what they're talking about. It is a very complicated subject. We can have that conversation, but we have to at the same time be understanding of the basics because I can tell you now from the jobs that I've done, very few people have knowledge about the reality of the lives of other communities in this country. And without that, we cannot fulfil the will of the people because sections of the people are not in the conversation. Okay, thanks. Just signal to me now, hands, while Sophia is speaking. Sophia, go ahead. Um, look, at the end of the day, whether or not you think that we should have held a referendum or held a referendum on this particular topic, you, we, people were asked whether or not we should leave or remain in the European Union. They were not asked about the nature in which we should leave, nor the future relationship that we should hold with the European Union. Now, I think whatever you think of the way in which the last three and a half years have played out, that is central to the reason why we have not left the European Union thus far. Now, I think most people would agree that the fact that preparations were not made for any kind of leave vote in a substantive way within the government um, ahead of that referendum, that all of the very good work that a lot of the select committees are doing in the Commons and the Lords, um, which has subsequently been made available to members and to the public, that that was not done before the referendum and made public and accessible. Um, so it's, it's not simply that you, you certainly do have members of the House of Commons who would like to see the Brexit vote reverse. That is absolutely clear. But there are also many, many members who are happy to respect the results of the referendum but dispute the manner in which we leave. This is why it is taking so long. Um, so I, I think we need to be careful to make that distinction. It is not the case that every single person in the House of Commons is trying to frustrate the vote. They are negotiating the manner of the exit, and they may be doing that in a frustrating way. OK, thanks. Right, this is our last round of questions, so make them brief. Yeah. Um, when the whole Brexit thing happened, um, I thought it might be useful to go back and look into history and look at the other debates on democracy um, that, that, that went on 200 or so years, years ago when democracy first um, sort of was, became a massive uh, public debate. And I read, um, one of the things that I read that I can recommend is uh, Thomas Paine's Rights of Man. And um, it, it, I think it would be helpful in this discussion if we all went back and looked at, back at some of those discussions from old, because there are 
you know, sort of themes that came up then that um, have come up since in other uh, revolutions and um, uprisings and that are, that are echoing um, in this one. And the big argument that uh, Thomas Paine had with um, his nemesis, Edmund Burke, was the interpretation of the French Revolution, which um, the British uh, government, the elite, uh, the landowners, they were all shit scared um, that this democratic uprising was going to come to British shores. And um, Edmund Burke, his, his, his opposite, characterised it as dangerous, populist, authoritarian, trampling on the rights of the minority. Um, and, and here we are again, um, e echoing the, 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 against the popular will. And, uh, you know, I, I would try and reach out to the, to the losers and say to the losers in this, in this argument, um, I'm not against the rights of the minority. Why are you so scared? These things are not mutually exclusive. We can move forward together, but only if we do it th through the majority decision. Okay, thanks. Pass that microphone along, along there to this guy and stand up. Um, <clears throat> if there's one thing, if there's one conclusion I think I can draw from listening to all of this uh, for the last half an hour or so, the question is, who are the people? Where I can say one thing, the people are not in here. This is almost ludicrous to come here and have a bunch of academics and middle class and the intelligentsia sit here debating who the people are, when the reality of the fact is no one in this room has spoken to a normal working class person in the last 30 years. Now, now. Thank and you. And I don't, I don't mean that as an attack on the audience. I, I really don't. I don't. Let's take it personally. Finish your point. I, I will. Um, and I think really what is quite dangerous is the arrogance of academics like Akil going, oh, the common people are too stupid to talk about immigration because he has a degree, he must enlighten us. Right. And then the common people are to be given the right okay. to talk about the things that affect their no, lives. And I think that kind of arrogance is really quite ludicrous and quite dangerous. Thank you. If that microphone goes all the way to the top of the lady at the end. Here, stand up. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, one of the problems that I think inform a lot of these discussions is a failure to properly place the uh, the, the fact of conflict in our political community. So far, we've touched on the possibility that conflict's bad. No one really seems to think that. And it, but the alternative that has been pressed so far is that conflict is sometimes good because it helps to produce positive outcomes. And I think that's often true. That is, that is definitely the case. But conflict has a more constitutive or fundamental place in our society. We, conflict exists not just to pursue or facilitate goods. It exists because the things that we value are plural, and they conflict. And they conflict not just in that we can't, we don't have enough money or our hearts are not sufficiently pure. They conflict because they, by their nature, exclude each other. You, you cannot have, have it all. This is a fundamental feature of any plural political community. And this is where, despite the fact that I think, uh, Sophia, you've been, certain ideas have been unfairly foisted on you, this is where I think I would probably want to push back on the idea of populism. Uh, and one of the important things that they point to, particular populists point to, is the agonistic character of society and the fact that these things do exclude each other. And until we embrace that, and accept that most of these sorts of issues can't properly be addressed. Thank you. Pass the microphone back to the guy in the grey shirt there. Now please make them snappy. Uh, it will be very snappy. So we all agree we want to believe in people. So if we do, the only problem is we distrust our people, we distrust what we call elite. So if we want a way out, then we should all vote for sortition, which means a random sample of everybody in the population, statistically significant, will get to vote. And that will take away the distrust, because maybe if you didn't get your chance next time it will be for you. Okay, thank you. Pass it to the gentleman in the black straight in front of you, this guy here. <coughs> um, for most of my political life, I, I always thought that um, the people, uh, when you heard the, the, word, uh, the words the people, what, the, what we were referring to was working class people and, you know, the existence of class in society where one very, the majority of people in society were represented by socialist ideas, laborism, trade unionism, whatever. Those days are gone. But in the last 20 years, what has emerged is a, in society is a group of people who call themselves experts on every aspect of our lives, from what we eat to what we drink, what kind of sex we have, what language we use, and how the resources of society should be applied in any given circumstance. And so a, a body of experts has emerged that do not feel that democracy and the will of the people, if you like, uh, serves the best interest of where society should be going. And uh, you know, I think that's not a, 
that's not something that can be resolved easily. It's a historical kind of new era we're entering into, where we have to decide on what is the best way that we live in the future, according to democratic principles or according to those who consider themselves to be experts in all the given areas of our existence. Okay, thanks. We're running out of time. I've got two more. Bring the microphone down to this lady in the middle. Guy at the back with the microphone. Go ahead. Stand up. Right, hello. Um, I, I think I just want to pick up on this gentleman's point about um, the, the referendum has highlighted the difference between direct democracy and representative democracy. Of course, in ancient Athens, uh, you had a form of direct democracy because you had a small enough number of citizens to make that possible. Um, and, and over time, democracy has clearly evolved from previous uh, systems such as uh, the rule of the king and then the rule of aristocracy. And, and then the rule on behalf of the people, um, uh, championed by Labour and so on. Um, it's quite interesting to see the tension um, when you have representative um, asking the people to tell them what to do and then having to do what they're told to do by the people after, after they've been voted in by the people to make the decision on behalf of the people. Um, okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Ladies in the front. So maybe the question as to who other people is answered in, in, in one way. So I'm full of admiration for this country. I'm, I'm really almost envious that you were allowed and that you had a Brexit vote and a referendum as you did. Because I come from a country where we're not allowed, we haven't been allowed ever to vote on anything to do with the EU. And this, and I think populism does come up when something is wrong, when people haven't been heard for far too long. Um, and. The thing that fascinates me so much is that this was a vote where we were, the question was so important. It really did make a change as to where you stood. Are you in favor of the EU or are you against the EU? Are you in favor of banning slavery or are you against it? There are questions which boil down to a very, very clear yes and no. The country I come from is Germany, a very crucial country in the EU. And Germany, I suppose, is one of the few countries and the only countries which has never, ever allowed its citizen a vote on that crucial question. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there for audience contributions. Um, now we've got four minutes. You guys each have one minute to sum up. Sphere. Okay, some very quick five points to this uh, lady from Germany, but you sound quite English now as well. Um, I think that one of the dangers of the way in which the Brexit referendum is being addressed or interpreted or whatever is that it is obviously sucking an enormous amount of energy from Whitehall. And I mean, I sort of foresaw this as one of the, the risks of actually a leave vote, and this is the conundrum at the heart of it, is that there is absolutely no social policy making going on. In, in Whitehall at the moment. And there hasn't been for three and a half years, and there probably won't be for a decade, because uh, to address the myriad of issues that people were voting for um, when they voted in that referendum. So that was always a, a sort of paradox of Brexit. Um, misinformation was referred to earlier. I just do want to make the point that I do think this is really important. We should take this seriously, and all sides should take it seriously. Even if you feel you're the beneficiary or on one side or that it's the, others, the other sides of the, perp the key perpetrators, all sides are engaged in this at the moment. Um, and we need to be really, uh, really, really vigilant about it and its impact in democracy. French Revolution, I do always want to caution that we seem to forget that the terror came afterwards um, as well. So let's always remember that. And also, just when we talk about working class populations. Uh, this is true not just in Britain, but we should also be careful that we're not just talking about a sort of 1970s conception of working class. The, the, uh, the very definition of working class is we should not make a homogenous um, conception, and actually we should appreciate the tremendous amount of diversity that's also going on within our socio-economic groups at the moment. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, okay. um, yeah um, I don't think anyone is too thick. I think we all get the point I was making, which is without kind of information, people are scared to have conversations because you can go down a rabbit hole, and I, I see and I see that all the time. Uh, and I think and and I and I think the point that was made um, uh, about the French Revolution uh, is an interesting one if you if you use it as a, an example to talk about the things I think that are really important, which is 
not so much about the revolution itself, but about learning from our history and learning from things that have gone on before. And actually, whether, and that's why when I think about the referendum vote and actually, and the people who do want to stifle it, they are not learning from history because that of our recent history has been. I think we have gone into this, as has been mentioned by someone earlier on as well. We have got, we have fallen into this populism, if you want to call it trap, although I have no problem, I consider myself to be a populist, uh, we have fallen into that particular kind of trap because people haven't been listened to for so long, which, uh, whoever they are. And when they've voted, they've voted because we've heard that conversation about ex experts and etc. And even I've been accused of being some liberal academic, which is the first time in my life, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, and if you want to know about working class yeah, you're, you're looking at the man who came from it. Um, um, and so in that sense, we have not listened to these people. And my, cause, because we've not listened to them, that's why we end up where we are today. And we have to find that way of actually listening, but at the same time, learning from our history and actually educating people about what's going on around them so they can have that conversation and then they can decide to vote where they want to vote. And we probably would end up with the same result. Who knows? But the fact of the matter is that you cannot dismiss what people have voted for, but if we want going forward, we have to understand it is going to become way more complex and way more complicated, and we have to find a way forward about how we vote and how we get that information across. Thank you very much. Stuart, final Just on, this, on the last lady from Germany who spoke, I mean, I, I, I agree. I, I, think that, I think the referendum was the right thing to do. I think there should have been a referendum because the European project had transformed completely from the one that we bought into in the early 70s. I completely agree with that. I happen to think the way the referendum was structured was, was done really badly. And it didn't resolve the questions, which is one of the reasons we're in this turmoil. And by the way, one of the big reasons that we're still stuck in this paralysis is because you know, the two leading lights of the Brexit campaign, Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, can't agree on what Brexit is. So that, it's, 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 the Remainers have had their part to play. There's no doubt about it, particularly the ones, as we said earlier, who, have, who think that you can still refight the whole thing. But it is much more complicated than just a kind of establishment revenge against the people, in my view. But the last thing I want to say about this point about experts, and this is a really important point, that w so we're in a world where we think that somehow people, well, a, there is a view that if you're an expert, somehow that that view should trump whatever a majority might come up with, right? But one of the rules about democracy is that, uh, I think Mick said this earlier, is that you don't retrospectively condemn the quality of a majority you disagree with by saying they weren't educated enough. You can say that about every majority decision at any point in any election or any referendum, right? You, can't, you, you haven't got the right to resort to that as a way of nullifying the result. I think there's one other quick thing. Something that's really happened that the referendum expresses, in my view, is that for too long, Labour and Conservative politics thought that economics was the only important thing that really mattered. And within the economics that really mattered, the only thing that really mattered in that was a very sort of city based based idea of what the economic interest was. That has been smashed by lots of things, including the Brexit referendum. And I think that that is the, probably the most disruptive thing of all, it, to, to embrace the idea of populism. If that's a populist uh, contribution to politics, I think that's a good populist contribution to politics. Thank you, Stuart. Mick. Uh, yes, sorry, too many complicated points. I'll just make one. I think what the Brexit thing uh, does is what it's revealed most starkly is how thin the veneer of um, uh, respect for democracy amongst the upper echelons of our society is and what absolute contempt they actually hold a large proportion of the people in. Um, there was a discussion... Somebody was making the point about studying history, which I really agree with, and the interesting thing about the Burke-Payne debates, the great debate really worth studying, is that actually, unfortunately, Burke won. And the idea that MPs know better than the people who elect them is actually the basis on which our parliamentary democracy operates now. That's why you have a Labour Party in Parliament where over 90% of the MPs are Remainers representing s seats which are 70% leave. And that's, that, that's the kind of gap that we're talking about between our political elite and, our, and, and the people. So our friend over here who managed to very neatly insult uh, the working class half of the audience and the panel... Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, definitely has a point. The arrogance of what we might call the clerisy in our society, uh, the contempt in which they hold uh, uh, normal people, uh, and the refusal to discuss them is absolutely evident in all of these uh, discussions. And I think that's why our political class has been hiding behind the barricades of Parliament for the last few months, trying to avoid at all costs having any kind of referendum or general election. Um, now we have a general election. I can guarantee you that during that campaign they will be demonstrating how terrified they are uh, of the people. And I... Uh, 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 encourage everybody to take the opportunity to show them what, they, what we think of them, uh, regardless of whether we get accused of being populists or not. Thank our speakers.
right? Do often have your lunch. There are book signings going on outside the festival bookshop. If you're quick, there's a hot off the press happening. Uh, get your lunch in and around Ideas Market and enjoy the rest of the festival. See you after lunch.